Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am Daisy, your hostess, and you are in my book playlist where we are going through the book titled Within You is the Power by Henry Thomas Hamblin, and it is in the public domain. We're moving forward. We've just gotten off of chapter 9 and 10 in the previous video, and covered a lot of territory with the subconscious mind and the super conscious. So if you haven't ch checked that out, please do so. I believe it's going to set the stage for this next chapter, which is titled Happiness and Joy. So going right into it, chapter 11, I'm excited to see what this is about because I believe we all need a little more happiness and joy in our lives. So let's get to it. Deep down in every heart is an unquenchable desire for happiness. The advanced soul desires happiness just as much as the pleasure-seeking worldling. The difference between them is simply that the former, through knowledge and experience, does not search for happiness, knowing that it can never be found by direct seeking, but finds it through service and love to others, and in victory over self, while the latter seeks happiness like a will-o'-the-wisp in every form of pleasure and finds it not. Man is never satisfied with his life. He is forever seeking something that is better. Until he learns wisdom, he looks for it in pleasure, in sense gratification of various kinds, in wealth, luxury, and possession. The less evolved a man is, the more convinced he is that happiness can be gained in these ways, and the lower are his desires. For instance, those who form what is called the underworld of our cities seek happiness in vice and debauchery. Those who are more evolved seek pleasure in more refined things, hoping to find happiness in intellectual pursuits, friendships, and in pure human loves. These more evolved types get much more pleasure through the sense than do those who are more elemental, but they are capable also of greater and more acute suffering. They can derive great pleasure from a picture gallery, whereas a savage would see nothing interesting at all. They can also suffer from things which a savage would not be capable of feeling, yet in spite of this developed refinement and ability to derive pleasure from art, science, literature, happiness is still as far off as ever. All attempts at finding happiness lead finally to emptiness. There is no satisfaction either in wealth and all that it can command, getting on in life or in fame and power. They allure at first and promise happiness, but they fail us and finally are seen to be but vanity and vexation of spirit. This desire for happiness is good, for it leads us through innumerable experiences so that the soul can realize by practical experience the emptiness of all self-seeking and thus learn wisdom. After running the whole gamut of experience, the soul learns at last that happiness is not something that can be found by seeking it, but it is an inward mental state. Although work, well done, brings a quiet sense of satisfaction, and success in one's career may also be a source of gratification for a short time, yet even these cannot satisfy the deep longing of the soul. Happiness, however, is to be found in service. Not if we seek happiness in service and serve in order to be happy, but if we serve others for the sake of serving, we find the only happiness that will endure and satisfy. One has only to observe the lives of those who are always selflessly seeking and grabbing who are hard in their dealings and always looking after number one in order to see how impossible it is for self-seekers to be happy. 
It does not matter whether they acquire riches or remain poor. They are equally unhappy. In contrast to this, you have only to go out of your way to do a kind and perfectly disinterested action and experience the glow of sheer happiness that it brings in order to realize that you are dealing with a law of life that is sure and unalterable as the law of gravitation. There must be a purpose in life, and this must have for its object the betterment of the lives of others, either few or many. The law of service must be obeyed, otherwise there can be no happiness. This may fill some readers with dismay, for they may be employed in an occupation that apparently does no good to anybody. They may feel that if they were engaged in some noble enterprise for the uplift of humanity, then they could truly serve. But in their present occupation, this is impossible. To think thus is very natural. Yet the truth is, we can all obey the law of service and can begin now in our present occupation, no matter what it may be. We have only to do our daily work not as a task which must be got through in order to bring us a living or because it is expected of us that we should work, but as an offering of love to life and the world in order to come into harmony with the great law of service. Our ideas of values with regard to occupations are altogether erroneous from the inner wisdom point of view. The scrubbing of a doorstep, if faithfully done in a true spirit of service, is of as much value and real importance as the writing of a deathless poem or dying for one's country. We can never truthfully say that one act of service is of greater value or is more important than another. All that the higher law looks at is the motive. Therefore, if your motive is right, you can be engaged in the humblest and apparently most useless occupation and yet be happy because you satisfy the law of service. Another road to happiness is the conquest of the lower nature, the overcoming of weaknesses, the climbing to higher and better things. There is intense happiness in realizing daily that old habits are being overthrown, weak points in the character built up, and an ever-increasing state of liberty and freedom entered into. Thank God we do not have to remain as we once were, but can progress upwards indefinitely, for there is no limit to our upward climb. But there is a state that is far higher than happiness, and this is joy. Happiness comes through service and overcoming, but joy comes only to one who realizes his oneness with his divine source. The reality is ineffable joy. Behind this world of shadows is the real spiritual world of splendor and delight. When the soul after its immense journey through matter, time and space, at last finds its way back to its divine source, it becomes aware of this intense joy, too great to be described in words. It not only realizes that the reality is joy and the universe filled, not with groans or sighing, but with sweet, quiet laughter of freed souls, it also is filled itself with this ineffable joy. What has all this got to do with practical everyday life, it may be asked? Everything. For the one who possesses this quiet joy can never be defeated in life's battles. He has something within him that can never be quenched and which will lead him from victory to victory. All right, 
This concludes chapter 11. Stay right here, right now, on this video, because I'm moving right into chapter 12, titled, The Use and Misuse of Mental and Spiritual Powers. The average individual knows nothing of mental forces, and although he may suffer from the effects of unconscious wrong thinking, yet he is in no danger of making deliberate misuse of the inner powers. One, however, who has learned how to use these interior forces must be very careful to use them aright, or he will find that the invisible powers of mind and spirit are far more powerful and destructive than dynamite. It is not meant by this that he can blow himself up thereby, but it does mean that he can injure himself, not only in this life, but for ages to come, and in addition, seriously retard his spiritual evolution. All use of the mind to coerce other people or to influence them by means of suggestion, not for their benefit, but for your advantage is highly destructive, not to them actually, but to you. On the face of it, it looks an easy road to success and prosperity, but actually it leads to failure and poverty. The misuse of the mental powers in this way is really a form of black magic, and the fate of all black magicians is very terrible. Even the use of the mind to coerce other people for their good is not desirable. It never does any real good. Although it may seem beneficial for a time, and its use, therefore, is to be deprecated. Healing, so-called by heterosuggestion, is not permanent. For as soon as the healer ceases to pump suggestion into the patient, the latter begins to relapse into his former state. Far better results accrue if the patient is taught to use auto or self-suggestion for himself. It is seen then that the use of the mind to influence others is distinctly harmful if it is used selfishly, and of no real use if used unselfishly. Hypnotism is harmful no matter which way it is used, and is also detrimental to the patient. Because of this, some of our more thoughtful neurologists have given up its use. We have no right to endeavor to influence other people by the use of our inner forces, even if our object is their good. Each soul has the right to live its life in its own way and choose for itself either good or evil. That is the object of life, so that each evolving soul should learn wisdom through the lessons learned as a result of its own mistakes. Far worse is it if others are coerced, not in order to help them, but to defraud them or to make them buy goods they do not require or sign agreements they would not otherwise put their name to. One who misuses his mental and spiritual powers literally smashes his life up. He works against the laws of life and the universe and encompasses his own ruin. There is, however, a far more subtle way of misusing the mental and spiritual forces than by coercion, mind domination, and heterosuggestion. This method is equally destructive and if persisted in, builds up a painful future. With this method, other people are not influenced or dominated, but the finer forces of nature are coerced by the human will. Mental demands are made on the invisible substance from which, we are told, all things are made, and wealth is compelled to appear. In addition to this, sickness, so it is claimed, is banished and the invisible forces of life are compelled to operate in such a way as to make life's pathways a bed of roses without thorns, so that life becomes shorn of all its discipline and experience. Its devotees enter the silence, 
and there visualize exactly what they think they want and compel it to appear in material form. By the strength of their desire or through the exercise of their will. Some followers of this cult may be able to make an apparent success of it, but I have never yet met any. If they do, however, they will live to regret it, for they are merely practitioners of black magic. Their efforts are of the same nature as sorcery. All such methods build up a heavy debt of future suffering and seriously hinder the soul in its evolutionary journey. Entering the silence is a good thing. It is really entering the inner silence of the soul, the inner sanctuary where the divine spirit abides in fullness. To misuse this inward power for selfish and material ends and for forcing our human will upon life so as to make it conform to what we think it ought to be is a crime of the first magnitude which can result only in an ultimate failure and disaster. This concludes chapter 12. I'll meet you at the next video where we'll jump into chapter 13.